The external oblique intercostal block is a new technique that aims to anesthetize the upper quadrants of the abdomen, and in this video we'll discuss the rationale, anatomy, sonoanatomy, and the technique for this fascial plane block. As our understanding of truncal innervation gets more refined, we've been able to come up with a number of solutions for various patterns of incisional pain. One thing that's become clear is the tap block is great for lower abdominal incisions, but just doesn't cut the mustard above the umbilicus. There are several fascial plane block approaches for tackling this area. One of these is the oblique subcostal tap block. The idea here is to place local anesthetic just below the costal margin in the plane superficial to the transversus abdominis muscle. You can see here the local anesthetic peeling apart that plane between rectus abdominis and the transversus, and the local continuing to unzipper that same plane as the needle is advanced laterally and caudally, ending up between internal oblique and transversus. Now that all sounds great, but there's a problem. What we've just described targets the anterior cutaneous branches of the upper abdominal intercostal nerves, but doesn't block the lateral cutaneous branches. So it's not surprising that the pattern of sensory blockade is more or less a fat midline strep. It's a different approach to the rectus sheath block, essentially. Importantly, these lateral areas are not blocked, and while that may be okay for some epigastric incisions, there are indications where you do need that lateral coverage. Chevron incisions for hepatobiliary surgery are the obvious example, but there are others such as nephrectomy, excision of Wilms tumor, open gallbladder, etc. The external oblique intercostal block has been proposed as a solution to this. Let's look at the anatomy. We tend to think of the external oblique as being an abdominal muscle, and it is, but there's a good chunk of it that lies over the thoracic cage. It arises from the lower six ribs, running down and medial to insert on the linea semilunaris. If we peel that away, we find the rectus abdominis medially and the internal oblique laterally. The rectus also attaches to the rib cage, in this case inserting on the costal cartilages of ribs 5, 6, and 7. Now, the idea behind this block is that a needle is advanced from above and local anesthetic deposited deep to the external oblique at the 6th or 7th rib. It will then spread to anesthetize both the lateral cutaneous and anterior cutaneous branches of the intercostal nerves of T6 to T10. Wait a sec, how does that work? Okay, so here's a schematic of the intercostal nerve running deep to the internal intercostal muscle and giving off a lateral cutaneous branch before terminating near the sternum. External oblique and serratus anterior lie superficial to the ribs and intercostal muscle, and at the point where they come together, the lateral cutaneous branch pops out to innervate both the anterior lateral and posterior lateral trunk. The injection for this block occurs here, between external oblique and the chest wall. The local anesthetic will spread extensively, running posteriorly to catch the lateral cutaneous branches in the same way a deep serratus plane block does, but it also runs anteriorly, catching the anterior cutaneous branches. Let's look at that anterior anatomy a little closer. Here we see a cut through the chest at the level of the xiphoid process. We see the costal cartilages and intercostal muscle between them. Near the midline, we have that upper portion of rectus abdominis and more laterally, the external oblique muscle. The fascia of the external oblique merges anteriorly and forms the anterior rectus sheath at this level, leaving a passageway for the local anesthetic placed here to run forward and enter the rectus sheath. Here's what that spread looks like in a cadaver. 20 mils of dye extensively covers the anterior lateral chest and definitely knocks out the lateral cutaneous branches of T6 through T10. In this cadaver experiment, 30 mils of injectate was used, and you can clearly see that not only do we get the lateral cutaneous branches, but there is intense staining of the upper anterior cutaneous branches and dye within the rectus sheath, with consistent blockade of T6 through T9 or T10. To perform this block, a linear probe is placed on the chest wall just medial to the anterior axillary line over the sixth rib, parasagittal in orientation. The needle is advanced from cephalad to caudad. Here's a typical picture with that probe position. We see the sixth and seventh ribs and the intercostal muscle between them. The external oblique muscle is the only structure superficial to the chest wall here, and we see that an injection of local has lifted that muscle up off the ribs. Here's that anatomy again pre-block. Now the needle is advancing from the cephalad aspect, entering the external oblique muscle. Our initial injection creates a space, but isn't spreading up and over the rib like we want. We push forward towards the rib and then inject again, this time with good elevation of the muscle. We'll use a total of 20 to 30 mils of dilute local anesthetic per side. Here's the expected sensory coverage from an external oblique intercostal block, representing blockade of both the anterior and lateral cutaneous branches of roughly T6 to T9 or 10. There are several attractive aspects to this block. First, it's easy sonoanatomy. Ribs, one strip of muscle, that's it. 
No trying to deduce which muscle is which or which plane is which. Even in heavy patients, this sonoanatomy is reliably easy to see. It's also nice that the patient is supine. We'll often do this at the end of the case, and unlike an ESP, paravertebral, or anterior QL block, we don't have to get the patient up on their side. Similarly, there's a bony backstop. Unlike the tap block, where it can be frustratingly challenging to open up that intermuscular fascia plane, this plane peels up off the ribs easily. I'll typically land my needle on the seventh rib, and my test injection with saline lifts the muscle off on the first try, more often than not. Because this is an easily expandable fascial plane, it accommodates a catheter well. Here we see the injection through a TUI needle in the three-year-old. Nice typical expansion. After the catheter is placed, a small test injection shows fluid expansion in the correct plane. Another advantage over subcostal tap is you don't have to worry about the presence of an abdominal incision or dressing. Attempting a subcostal tap with this incision would be virtually impossible given the tissue disruption, and your surgeon might not thank you. That's ignoring the fact that it wouldn't cover the lateral aspect. And finally, because it's a relatively shallow block with no big vessels nearby, anticoagulation is not a concern in the way that it might be for epidural analgesia or anterior QL block. This is a huge advantage for our liver transplant patients who are both coagulopathic and deserving of high-quality analgesia.